Welcome back to Let's Code. Today we're gonna go a level up from Sycamore and talk about Perseus. Perseus is that higher level meta framework on top of Sycamore's reactive bindings. So you can think of Sycamore as the core library with the reactivity and with the ability to render to HTML. And you can think of Perseus as the higher level tooling, the stale while we validate, the server side rendering and hydrate on the client, but not just the hydrate functionality, rather the additional functionality and framework built-ins that make that work seamlessly through your entire application, through multiple routes and multiple pages. Before we get directly into Perseus, however, I wanna take a look at what it looks like in Sycamore to do a couple of the things that Perseus is doing for us so that we have something to compare to from the raw bindings that Sycamore gives us to the high level meta framework that Perseus is. So here we've got an example of hydration. We've got an index as usual, the cargo toml with the dependencies and the main.rs that has our entire application in it. Now, a curious thing about this example is that it includes the pre-rendered or server-side rendered HTML in the index.html file here. So when we look in the main.rs, you can see that there's a render to string, much like React or other frameworks have a render to string that accepts a view that of course accepts the context as usual or the scope and also our application and renders that to a string and then logs it out to the console. If we look at the console, we can see that HTML output. So this render to string is actually running anywhere we run this, in this case, in the browser. But that's just a function call to show us that the render to string does indeed output what's in the index.html file. So if you're expecting this to be a full, like running server and client, this is not that. This is just an index.html file with some HTML that was rendered out and copied into that file. And then we also call Sycamore Hydrate. And you can see that Sycamore Hydrate isn't a lot different than what we passed to render to string because our app isn't really doing anything special. We're not passing in any extra data dependencies or doing anything that would require finagling this. If we look at the index.html, you can see that there are data attributes, specifically data HK, that include a numeric tree is what I'll call it. So it's the root here is one. And then if we go down the list of items, the IDs change. Now, I believe what's happening is that everything that is a root element is getting the root of one for the ID. So you'll see one dot on this paragraph tag inside of the body. You'll see BR on the par or on the break tag inside of the body. And you'll see one dot two on this break tag that's also at the root. But something like this div that has additional children inside of it will get the ID two as the root ID. And as far as I can tell, this occurs because it passes basically breadth first when assigning these IDs. So it'll get all the top level stuff and then it'll start back at the top and it'll go through the next layer or all of the ones that have children and assign those IDs. And then as you go down that list, the second ID increments. So two things interesting here, there are IDs for all of our elements and there are these HTML comments. Now I believe that these HTML comments are significant, although I have not confirmed that because uh, this reminds me of the way that React used to do things. It was IDs and then it was things like comments and they just need a way to mark different places in the DOM to reattach to on the client side. So this all works. It adds, it subtracts, uh, it resets. You've got a paragraph here that is not hydrated. So if we go in and I can find the disabled JavaScript button and we refresh, the client side only stuff disappears but the paragraph that is not hydrated, which will be inside of 4.0, I believe, yeah, right here, is not rendered. Notice that we still have the 5.0 div because it's still in the, in, the, uh, in the HTML, but the client side content inside of it has not rendered. And we do see one of those HTML comments here, sort of indicating that there's a gap. So we can re-enable JavaScript and we see the client come back and the client element show up in the DOM. And this is all well and good, but I find the way that it actually uh, is denoted in the code very interesting. So we have our app component, which has the same function signature in Sycamore as we've been used to. We have a view as the return value, which we've seen before. And then we have the Sycamore web no hydrate and Sycamore web no SSR components. So this component or any of the children of this component won't render on the server or won't be SSR'd. So if we do a render to string, these won't be rendered. And in this case, these will only be rendered on the server. Now, I don't know how similar 
the functionality that is indicated here is to something like React Server Components, but we'll get into a little bit more of that in a second. So TLDR is Sycamore has server-side rendering, Sycamore has client-side hydration, Sycamore has components that can render on the server or the client exclusively, and all of that works without touching Perseus at all. But you would have to set up your own server because Sycamore doesn't come with, say, a web server kind of thing for you to attach to. Another example I found particularly in Lightning is this example here that just is a page visit counter. So if we refresh this, you can see it flash right there for a second. And if I throttle the network to slow 3G, we should be able to see it happen a lot slower. So we're seeing loading and then we're seeing total visits pop in. So I'll take that throttling off so I don't forget and <laughs> leave it enabled for my normal web browsing, for my normal web browsing. And if we take a look at the example here, I find the example super interesting. So this is the example of basically suspense, if you will, uh, in a, like a React term. In our world, in Sycamore world, all this means is that we've got an async component and we're using this suspense struct to, or the suspense component to fall back to something else. So we've got our fallback specified here. Our fallback is another component. So it's another view, basically. In this case, we just have loading. It could be, as far as I can tell, anything. And then we've got the visits count for when whatever thing is happening inside of this visits component is done. So in this case, we have our regular component attribute macro, and all we need to do to make this an async component, something that will fetch basically on render, is call it an async function. Once it's an async function, the function signature changes a little bit. We have a anonymous lifetime specified here for scope, but otherwise it's the same function signature that we've been used to with all the other Sycamore stuff. The interesting part being, of course, that we can just run any async code in here. In this case, it's fetch visits passed with an ID, which just makes a request via Rick Wasm and gets back some JSON, which is deserialized into a visits struct, which we can see up here is just a value. So we fetch visits, we await it, and then we unwrap or default. So in this case, if this function failed, we would get the default value of total visits zero because zero is the default value for a number. And we've just got a component to render it. And all we did was have this async function just sitting here inside of our async component. And it kind of just pauses for a second, falls back and then renders. To me, this is a really elegant way of uh, encoding this. We haven't quite gotten to the full suspense rollout in the JavaScript ecosystem. And since we have these async functions in Rust, I really like this approach for that use case specifically. But all of that together brings us to Perseus. Now we didn't cover a couple of things in Sycamore. We didn't cover the Sycamore router, for example, because Perseus has its own router. And if we check the documentation, there is quite a bit of documentation here, even more when you consider that this documentation that I'm scrolling through on the side here is on top of all of the Sycamore documentation. So Perseus is definitely a framework built on top of Sycamore. Perseus in their introduction goes over a number of different features that they support, a number of different rendering paradigms from server-side rendered to static site generation to how you implement caching if you decide to run this as a server, because if you run this as a server, you do then have to worry about caching the actual results. And they say, and I believe them from what I've seen, that they support sort of a wider breadth of these rendering options than pretty much any other framework that currently exists, including the ones in JavaScript. I think it's worth going over those in a separate video though. So we'll have a video on rendering strategies in Perseus, most likely. Today we'll be covering the Perseus Hello World. So Perseus itself has a CLI that they suggest that you download to build Perseus applications. I believe I read somewhere that they, they do actually make it clear that you could do this without the CLI, but the CLI is just something that they officially support and suggest that you use. The only dependencies that you strictly need to build a Perseus app are Perseus itself and Sycamore. I'm not sure how specifically these versions correlate. So for something in other frameworks in the JavaScript ecosystem, for example, it can be common to lock a major version of a framework like Next or Gatsby or whatever to a specific version, a major version of the underlying framework, React. But Perseus and Sycamore both aren't at 1.0 yet. So 
it may be that we need to spend a little bit more time tracking these dependencies to make sure that they stay in sync, or at least compatible. It is interesting that the documentation specifies Rust 2018 for Perseus, and that they specify Sycamore 0.7, because I know that Sycamore currently is on 0.8, and Sycamore 0.8, I believe, only supports Rust Edition 2021 at this point. So this Hello World example might be a little bit behind, but that shouldn't materially affect what we're going through today. They do have a note here that, like the examples in Sycamore, in the past it's been common to require an index.html, but Perseus now these days includes a default index.html, so you don't actually need to stick one in your application if you don't want one. And in fact, uh, elsewhere in the documentation, they let you use Sycamore to generate that index.html or Sycamore's HTML generation capabilities, which is kind of nice. I like that a lot. So this is our Perseus app. We pull in HTML Perseus app and template, and we use the Perseus main macro to sort of generate the root of our application. In this case, we call this function main, but it can be called anything because I believe Perseus main will rewrite this name. And the function signature here looks very similar to the Sycamore function signature. It's the generic G that we had before that has to implement the HTML trait. But in this case, we're returning a Perseus app with that generic rather than a Sycamore view or something like that. So the Perseus app has a builder pattern that we can use. So we Perseus new, and then we can add as many templates as we want to. Templates, uh, we'll probably get into more when we talk about different methods of rendering and different ways to build a Perseus application. But you can basically think of them as like the templates for the pages that you are going to render out. In which case, the template here makes a lot of sense because you've got a paragraph that says, hello world. So if we go do this ourselves, we can do cargo news. Let's call it Perseus test. I'll CD into that directory and open a VS code instance. I'm going to completely swap out the cargo.toml and use just what they gave me to use. I'll minimize the counter example that we had up before as well, since we don't need to look at that anymore. So we've got our dependencies here. We've got Perseus at 0.3.6 with the hydrate feature, we've got Sycamore at 0.7. I've got an extension in VS Code telling me that we could upgrade to 0.8.2, but I'm not going to do that because the tutorial doesn't say that that's okay yet. So I can test that out later. Then of course in main.rs, we have to throw in our template. So in this case, we don't only need the Perseus CLI, we also need Wasm pack installed. So I'm gonna cargo install both of them. And while that happens, I'm going to fix a mistake that I made. This needs to be lib.rs, not main.rs. So it told me that wasmpack failed because I already have wasmpack installed. So I'm just gonna leave it like that and hope that the version that I have works. Let me use Perseus serve instead of trunk serve. And we can see in parallel, we're getting generating your app, building your app to wasm and building server. So I believe generating your app is the static site generation. Building your app to Wasm is building the client-side Wasm bundle, and then bundle building server would be building the server-side binary that we would run. And of course, if we open this on what is effectively localhost 8080, we will see hello world, which is our template. Let's change this to hello YouTube and see if it just automatically updates. So you do need to run with Perseus serve dash W to watch your files. So if I wanted to change hello world to hello YouTube and save it, that would have to be with the dash W flag. And then it is not refreshing the page. I have to refresh the page manually. Although I thought I saw something about live reload in the docs. And yeah, there is on the left-hand side here, you can see live reloading. So we'll have to set that up. I wonder why that's not the default. So something that's super interesting is that we get this dot Perseus folder. This dot folder uh, in the name of the framework, like dot next or dot Gatsby or dot cache or whatever it is, is pretty common. There usually needs to be a place for uh, files to be output that can then be used to run a server or serve files from disk or something like that. So this is a very, very common pattern, um, but it does usually end up just being an additional caching directory. So we can see in here a bunch of like generated cargo tomls. We can see a lib.rs in the root. We can see the builder is a project. The dist is a bunch of static files. In this case, it's the index.html and stuff like that but just be aware that that folder is there. So they have a FAQ question in this tutorial. Uh, why do I need a CLI? Why do we need Perseus CLI? And it's because that directory is generating a bunch of different projects that then get built in certain ways. And the CLI controls that larger process 
So it's not just a cargo build or a trunk serve. It is uh, generating and building multiple different like Rust projects effectively. It does say the live reload server should be running. So I'm gonna do this again and see if it pulls down the new files. It does say reloading, but it never actually reloads the page. So maybe there's a bug in it right now, or maybe there's an issue with the browser I'm using. Let me do this. To rule out any shenanigans with Arc, because I have had issues with Arc before on caching certain things, we're gonna do hello YouTube third and save that, which also didn't work in Chrome. So there's something off about the live reload because I believe this is actually generated. So if I reload this, then we get hello YouTube third. And it says the live reload server is connected, but it isn't actually running. So, or it isn't actually working for me. Um, but all that said, I'm sure that that is either user error on my part or a small bug that can be easily fixed. So that's an intro to Perseus. There is a lot to go over here. So that's why this video was exceptionally long. I, I think it will be anyway. I haven't actually edited it yet, obviously. But we've got the server-side rendering, the static generation, the uh, live reload functionality we just saw, the client-side WASM bundle. There's a couple of other build techniques like data amalgamation that I'm looking forward to exploring. It seems like Perseus adds quite a bit on top of Sycamore. So you would probably not use Sycamore by itself, although you could. I think we've explored Sycamore enough to note that if you were building a client-side application that was pretty simple. You could just use Sycamore by itself to build that client side application. But once you get to the level of needing to do server side rendering or needing anything fancy like uh, stale while we validate or dealing with that caching or wanting multiple different rendering strategies between server side static and other techniques, then you would reach for Perseus fairly quickly. So I hope you enjoyed that video. There probably will be more Perseus content coming soon. And then on top of all of that, there's this interesting page that only has one plugin at the moment, but it's the size optimizations plugin. And potentially there could be reasons to write our own plugin. So hopefully we'll be able to upgrade Sycamore to 0.8 soon and we'll continue with Perseus. I hope you have a great day.